Good evening, Molly. Molly. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to everyone here in the room as well as those watching on TV or via the internet to this workshop on school start and dismissal times. Tonight is designed to allow the board to focus on what we've done to date get updates on things in progress, and hear from two other school districts who have already moved start times about their experiences and lessons learned. Just so everyone is clear, tonight's workshop is not designed to discuss the medical and health issues of teen sleep needs. This board has been well educated on those matters, and I don't believe we have any challenges to the scientific research from the CDC or the American Academy of Pediatrics on the sleep needs of our middle and high schoolers. This workshop will instead focus on logistical matters. As we look to shift start times, we need to dig deeper into the logistics and move toward making the best decisions we can for our county given our circumstances. To be perfectly clear, we are not making a decision or taking any vote on school start or dismissal times tonight. The board will take the information that we get tonight, we'll digest it and have further discussions about the best ways to move forward about bringing or, or before bringing a recommendation forward for public comment. As we begin this workshop, I would first like to welcome our guests from other school systems who have taken time out of their schedules to join us and lend their expertise and experience from the shift in their own districts. From Fairfax County, we have Jeff Plattenberg, Assistant Superintendent for Facilities and Transportation for Fairfax County Public Schools, and Phyllis Payne, a parental advocate for later start times. And from Montgomery County, we have Todd Watkins, Director of Transportation for Montgomery County Public Schools. We also have representatives from Jubbs Bus Service and Wilson Bus Service in the audience in case we have questions about bus logistics. But before we hear from anyone, I have asked Dr. McMahon and Kathy Lane from AACPS to give us a recap of our school system's work to date. And after our speakers have finished, the board will then have a chance to ask questions. As a reminder, there is no public comment at tonight's workshop. And with that, I will turn this over to Dr. McMahon, Kathy Lane. Thank you, Mrs. Korbelak, President Korbelak, and Dr. Arlotto and members of the board. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. We want to begin by acknowledging the hard work. I'll take you back in time to February of 2014 when the start times task force first met and so I'd ask at this time that they stand and be recognized not only to acknowledge their hard work but to also offer the public uh, an understanding of the depth and breadth of their knowledge base and the people that they represent the stakeholder groups so if the task force uh, members would please stand uh, we have lieutenant Doyle Batten who at that time was commander of the school safety section for Anne Arundel Police Department Pam Bukowski, President of Anne Arundel County Council of PTAs, Kia Chandler, parent and member of the County Citizen Advisory Committee, Franklin Cheney, Chief Recreation Services for Anne Arundel County Department of Recreation and Parks, Jason Horpskamp, a student at North County High School, a member of the Chesapeake Regional Association of Student Councils, Heather McIntosh, co-founder of Anne Arundel County Chapter of Start School Later, Wanda McIntyre, Transportation Specialist from Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Mr. William Myers, Principal of South River High School and President of the Association of Educational Leaders. Kate Snyder, Teacher at MacArthur Middle School and Representative of the Teachers Association of Anne Arundel County. Carol Streeter, Chair of the Parent Involvement Advisory Committee. Chris Truffer, Regional Assistant Superintendent, Annapolis and Broadnet Clusters. Teresa Tudor, Senior Manager of School and Family Partnerships. We can't give enough credit to the hard work and dedication. You'll see tonight the, the volume um, of work that they committed to this very challenging work, the amount of time and expertise from all their various stakeholder groups, which were well represented as we um, kind of explored all the options that you're going to see tonight. So to orient you to where we started, in February of 2014, Anne Arundel then super, Interim Superintendent Mamie Perkins formed a 15-member task force in response to community concerns about the current start time of Anne Arundel County Public High Schools and its impact on student health, safety, and learning. 
So over the subsequent six-month period, the school start times was charged with thoroughly examining school start times at all levels of the school system, culminating in a final report submitted to the Anne Arundel Board of Education in September of 2014. As you can see, the task force members per, uh, represented a number of community and school system organization reflecting a broad cross-section of Anne Arundel County Public Schools. So over the six-month period, this task force spent countless hours looking at a number of different topics. Just to give you a brief overview of the topics that they covered, they looked at the impact changing school start times would have on elementary, middle, and high school students and their families. They looked in depth at the impact that changing school start times would have on sports and extracurricular activities that students were engaged in. We called in experts from other jurisdictions who had made the change to school start times and had experience with that impact directly, and that informed the task force understanding. We looked in great depth uh, about the transportation impacts and had expert panels come in and speak to us by webinar and in person about the different transportation software options that were available. We wanted to ensure that while the task force was looking at changing start times to give adolescents more sleep, we wanted to ensure that this didn't happen on the backs of our elementary school students. So we spent a considerable amount of time looking at the impact specific to elementary and middle school students. We had the benefit of Fairfax County taking on this charge about six months ahead of us. So we were able to really look at their options and the research that they were using to guide their decision making and that was very informative to our task force members. We spent some time really looking at a, at a hybrid model and maybe creating an option that no one had considered before and we'll refresh you on what the, the details of that hybrid model were later in our discussion. We de then developed options for your consideration and outline pros and cons for each option because no solution was simple and every solution had pros and cons. Um, lastly, we developed this fabulous website under the leadership of Ms. Lauren Gray, who we can't thank enough as we were preparing for this presentation and we got back into the website and we said this was a really fabulous tool because of its um, being so facile and um, had access to all the information we looked at. And lastly, before providing you our executive summary, we called on Dr. Kayla Wallstrom, who was uh, um, in charge of um, the numerous research studies out of the University of Minnesota related to the health benefits for adolescents on increasing school um, sleep time. And so she was uh, the last information that we really considered before providing our executive summary to you. So with that, Dr. McMahon is going to kind of review the, the information that was on the website. So if you take a look at the website, as Ms. Lane said, we, we dug deeply. And so these people behind me have read hundreds of articles <laughs> to really inform themselves. And what happened was, you can see up there on the left-hand side, a section called Considerations. And when we really shook the tree, and things were distilled, it came down to health, the well-roundedness, which includes not only school, but after-school activities and sports, whether those are school-based activities or family-based activities, before and after child care, or young adult care in some cases, for our students, and transportation. Those were the four major drivers, because any task force uh, that really is going to be worth its weight at the end of the game has to have a belief structure on which to do its work. And so those were the drivers. And then as Ms. Gray goes to the bottom of the page, you'll see our beliefs. So as Dr. Arlotto and Ms. Korbelak already stated, the health issue, yes, the belief on the task force part was that adolescents with more sleep and starting after 7, 17 in the morning that would be ideal. But that it wasn't only about school and academics, that we wanted 
well-rounded. We believed in the well-rounded nature of children. And so that it was the curricular and the co-curricular opportunities and activities of young people that mattered. We did say for their safety, we really didn't want students walking in the late, late twilight just before darkness, whether that, or just before dawn, whether that was early in the morning or late in the afternoon, especially our youngest students, our elementary students. And then finally we said, you know, children don't live at school. They live in homes and they live in homes with multiple age children. And so that we really needed to be thinking about the family structure and what families needed and that families didn't want their students necessarily, their young students, unsupervised in the late day, possibly before adults or older siblings were to get home. And they also often needed before and or after school care. And finally, that it was family quality of life that drove much of what we talked about. So those are all important things to say. That's what drove what Ms. Lane will now start to talk about when we unveil the options, the four options that the START Task Force put forward. Thank you. So guided by these beliefs, the START Times Task Force discussed multiple ways um, to adjust start times of the high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools to afford adolescents more sleep and access optimal learning time for all our students. And we did that with each option, we ask the following questions. How much additional sleep will this option provide our adolescents? And is this option conducive for all of our pre-K to 12 learners? And will all students have the opportunity for a safe environment for walking to and from school? And how would this impact K to 12 sports and extracurricular activities? as well as how many buses and bus drivers will be required to implement these, each of these options. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, every solution had a set of variables um, that must be considered and that none of these solutions was a simple one. So if I can turn your attention to option A, which is essentially a middle school, high school shift where high school would begin at 8.30, the middle schools would begin at 9.30, and elementary schools would begin between 7.50 and 9.15. Um, with this option, there were a number of pros, where a pro being the, both the high school and the middle school students would get the recommended um, sleep from, uh, by the American Association for Pediatrics that most of the elementary schools, um, the potential scheduling adjustments would be minimal, and that elementary and middle school students would begin at a time of day that was safe for walkers. As reference to after school activities, the high school dismissal time would provide adequate time for the high school students to participate in after school sports and extracurriculars. But as you can see, there was also numerous cons for this option, um, including students who rode in the tier four getting home very late, walking sometimes from consolidated stops and potentially walking in the darkness. And middle school students um, may having less time after school for sports and ex extracurriculars, as well as the high school after school sports and extracurriculars might be impacted by early um, darkness in the late fall and early winter. Community sports would be pushed back in this option and that um, middle school students might have unsupervised alone time before leaving for school. Some schools, some families, they may, may need to then have um, daycare for their middle school students in the morning. This option also requires a significant number of additional buses. Um, and increase the number of buses driving during rush hour. This comes at a cost of $8.9 million. So option B. Option B is very similar to option A in many ways, but it's got even a later high school start time. As, as you may know that uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics and CDC have talked about start times later than 8 o'clock. So this one has a 9.15 a.m. start time, but it consolidates our middle school students to a, a, a narrower start in the 8.20 to 8.30 range. And then our elementary students stay basically the same with a few of our elementary student uh, schools starting earlier. 
many of the same pros and cons. Primarily here, uh, the pros, all being you know the later start times for our adolescents. The cons here have mostly to do with the after school programming, right? Uh, four o'clock end for a high school does change the opportunities our students have linked to darkness with our after school uh, activities that are played outside. Interscholastic sports played among our schools within the county, and that's not a problem, but when we go then to play schools outside the county, there can be some problems. We also had some stakeholders concerned about students with jobs having a, a more limited time to work after school. Those were some of the cons. The pros, certainly um, the elementary and middle school students being able to go primarily at the same time as they go now in the morning. They probably wouldn't need extra morning care. And the after school care, there were some concerns about the middle schoolers possibly being unsupervised for a period of time. Overall, it does require more buses. Um, and that's an approximate estimated annual cost of $9.4 million. Option C was uh, all schools shifting 30 minutes later than their current start times. And this created some pros where we had a potential gain of 30 minutes more sleep. Um, that falls a little bit short of the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended start time. But there would be a minimal impact on extracurricular schedules and a minimal impact on transportation routes and is the easiest to implement and the lowest relative cost. The cons for option C are it offers minimal sleep gains and that the late end of the middle school day would impact extracurricular activities for those students as well as parks and rec um, delaying their activities. And some elementary and middle school students might be impacted in the morning and have additional child care costs to cover that um, supervision for their children. This comes at an annual cost of $600,000. And finally, the task force put forward option D. Option D is a bit of a hybrid option. It takes the same um, option C into account. It's basically option C, all schools starting 30 minutes later. So it has that $600,000 price tag associated with it. But it has all those pros. You do get the 30 minutes later start for all students. What it does do is it allows some of the students, approximately 20% of the ninth, I mean, sorry, 10th through 12th grade students to be able to exercise in a program of choice kind of fashion, the option of taking a hybrid schedule. So they would start at 10 a.m., about 20% of those 10th through 12th graders, and we did the logistics on that. And yes, it does take a, a uh, an interesting amount of logistics to work that out, but we have the capacity to do that. And what that would allow for is some students to take a hybrid blended learning approach to their learning and have online classes as well. So about 20% of the population at the 10th through 12th grade level may opt for such a, a hybrid model. That has a price tag that's a little higher and it's a little higher, and you can certainly check out the website at 9.6 million. It's a little higher because it does require an infrastructure, a virtual classroom instructional platform that currently we really don't have that. Um, but other than that, uh, it is doable. So at, at this point, our task force work essentially ended. Mm -hmm. Oh, we, you want to cover the survey? Well, what we thought we would do is with those four options out there, right. then we took a survey. And so we had parents and guardians and students and employees, community members, and people from all facets. We said, what do you think? But we didn't just say, what do you think? We didn't just ask them what option you like. We said, what option do you like and why do you like it? Why are you choosing it? And do you have a few options that you like? And what would you do differently? if you were actually building the options. So we asked quite a lot of information here and we got a lot of information. The good news is we asked and people talked to us. They gave us reams of information of ideas. And many, if not almost all of their ideas really mirrored the task force work of wanting us to be considerate of the family of the daycare issues, of the 
uh, extracurricular, the co-curricular, and 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 some folks said don't change just to change. In other words, there were there were a lot of issues about we we want to tell you what we want, and so you can see there. This is the overall survey page. You can dig into the survey that's on the website to see the details. But overall, what you're seeing is that about 15% wanted A, 15, 16% B. 17% C, only a few percent D. So you're looking at, if you add those up, right, a sizable number of people said, we want change. They didn't necessarily all agree on what change. And then you can look at it the other way and say, there were 32% that said, don't change at all. So we're all over here, but overall, the majority said, change. So that's important to say, if there was any sentiment coming out of this, it was, we do want to step up. Over 2,000 people stepped up. We do want to step up and say something, and we want you to know what we're feeling. And the feelings were very tightly mirrored to the feelings that the task force set forth and the considerations they set forth initially when they went after providing you the four options. So at this point, um, the Star Times task force work ended, but yours began. And in December of 2014, Dr. Olato included in his recommended budget $750,000 to purchase transportation software and hire a transportation specialist to examine the efficiencies that could be gained um, by purchasing um, a transportation software. And in February, the Anne Arundel County Council passed a resolution encouraging this board and the superintendent to establish safe and healthy hours for all students. This board responded, or the, the county then responded in June, allocating $600,000 to address the issue of changing school start times, which on June 17th, this board voted to allocate. Um, and Dr. Alato has subsequently moved on that um, recommendation. We also heard feedback from the um, board members about not having some of the elementary schools end so late. If we were to start later, we didn't want our youngest child learners to be in school very late. So um, we looked at option C and created an option E1 and an E2. And so we took option C, which is a 30-minute start for all, and said, well, what if we didn't have any schools end after, any elementary schools end after 4.15? So there were just two elementary schools that were impacted by this. And so what we looked at was if we move those two into another tier, that would come at a cost of about $1.8 million dollars to include 30 additional bus runs to get those students transported bef um, in, in a different tier. And that does include your initial 600,000 to move all schools 30 minutes, right? So this is over and above that. So it, it's 600 plus another 1.2 million for a total of 1.8 million. Thank you. We also understood that there was four middle schools that would also and after 4.15 if we did the 30-minute shift. So we calculated for you um, the same moving those four middle schools, which included 117 additional buses needed approximately. And like Maureen said, with the original 600,000 for the 30-minute shift and adding the 107 buses, 117 buses we would need would come in at a total cost of about $7 million. Now that's a worst case scenario, right? Because that's without adjusting anybody else earlier in the morning. So that's with no flipping, that's just with shifting. So what we've done is we've layered buses, right? And so there's no tiering here, so we have to put more buses on the road. And so this is a worst case scenario, but it is real it, 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 as well. So now the last piece we did is we heard you when you said you didn't bring us an eight o'clock option. So option F, is an eight o'clock option. So what option F says is, what if we started high schools at eight o'clock and moved everybody 43 minutes, right? So 43 minutes. So we're basically saying the whole school system gets to come to school a little later, right? But 
at the same time, we take 16 elementary schools and four middle schools that would end after 415 and we bring them back so that no one ends after 415. And of course that comes at a higher price tag if everything overlaps. Now certainly you could do something where you skewed that and flipped things and did various things with it. But if you just started people all after eight o'clock, then you have a price tag of 15.2 million for that option. So in closing, if, um, if this board chooses to move forward and consider adjusting future school tar start times, this task force recommends the following next steps. To meet with community stakeholder groups to solicit public feedback on the proposed options and weigh that public feedback and adjust the models accordingly and to further study the potential impacts of the transportation software that has been purchased on improving bus routing and cost efficiencies. And lastly, getting a, having additional discussion on the impacts of Anne Arundel County Public Schools employees and other community stakeholder groups as needed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I think we're ready to hear from our Fairfax folks. <laughs> this computer next to me is looking for a password and I don't believe I have one. So I think he's gonna, someone's gonna have to be able to come over and somehow get me through this because I've set something up to give you a brief presentation. But first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for allowing me to come to speak before you. Um, President Kovalak, members of the Board of Education and Superintendent Arlotto, it certainly in, indeed is a pleasure to be able to share with so many folks committed to the same cause, and that's to find out what's in the best interest of our students. Um, we in Fairfax County, and of course my, my friend Todd Watkins here from Montgomery County, um, we have experienced a number of similarities. In fact, the work that your committee has done and also your staff amazingly pairs with the issues and concerns that we've constantly faced or pretty much came across. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to just go through a few things and we'll just kind of go pretty fast through it um, because what will probably happen is you'll see in this that in the presentation I've got before you, just go ahead and each one of these. You know, you talked about how the science, you didn't want to go back through the science, but the science is really significant. You know it, your committees know it, you've shared about it. The CDC and everything else has pretty much been bolstering, and the data that has really been like a wave behind all that initial information shows that really students aren't getting enough sleep, and they need to be really sleeping a little bit later in the mornings, especially at the high school level. And uh, with the American Academy of Pediatrics and everything they're saying, they're saying we should start, you know, students should be sleeping until 8.30. Well, I mean, starting school no earlier than 8.30. And you'll find that when we go through what Fairfax has done, um, we couldn't quite get to that sweet spot of 8.30. And we had a number of issues that we had to face during this whole process. And those issues were similar to the ones that you all faced. Child care. Some of the, some of the actual staff members were, how is this going to affect me personally? What does this mean to my life? I understand the science. I understand the importance for students. But this is a pretty disruptive change, and we need to help you help us navigate through it. So some of the data points, in April 2012, our school board adopted a resolution, much like you have, understanding the importance of this. That vision, that leadership that you provide really is significant, not only for the communities, but really for the public as a whole, to make sure that they are aware and understand what it is that you've taken the time to inform yourselves about. We went through a process of an RFP process to select a group to help us with it. Because 12 years prior and eight years prior, we had tried going down that road and been um, ineffective at achieving what the goals had been. But by setting the mission up, by bringing in, the, we had the Children's National Medical Center, uh, having the medical community associated with that, really helped articulate what you all already really know about and what you're really not interested in hearing me talk to you about this evening. So what happened in our process? Well, we first started talking about, we realized we needed to communicate and communicate and communicate and communicate and over communicate about everything that we were going through. We did that not only in our, we had these uh, initial stakeholder meetings that I'll get to in a little bit, but we took a, at a number of different scenarios about time iterations, much like you have. We looked at about 38 different iterations. And I love the fact that I heard what I heard this evening when you start talking about a hybrid model. 
because we found that those options and going through each of the individual options that we found, there was a little nuance here or a nuance there that significantly impacted positively what the costs were going to be and positively addressing some of the issues and concerns that members not only of our community had, but also of our staffs. So what did we do? We brought people together basically utilizing the same skills that we need in our students, the problem solving skills, the collaboration, the collective thinking, the creative thinking that goes on. And we took about and planned and studied a lot of these different results. And when then we found out that we needed to show the leadership to take the information that our committee, much like you have done, have come together and presented and then we boiled it down to a number of those scenarios to take back out to the community and have a really engaging communication plan. I can stand up here and I can speak before you, and many of our folks in our community are good orders. In fact, many are good debaters. And we have a lot of talented individuals that when we have what I call open mic night, it really doesn't allow the free flow of information. Contrary to what you might believe, when I talked in the public meetings, I talk about how shy I am how difficult it is for me to speak before public bodies, how challenging that is as a type of learner that I am. And therefore, I ask them, much like we ask a lot of our students to do, which is to be curious prior to being critical, and be curious about the information that we're sharing. And that's how you find the data results that you have, the data points of 32% of folks that just don't want change. And some people are resistant to change. Change is difficult. And that's why I cycled back about the communication, communication, communication piece. We came up with a number of transportation options. We had internal st uh, stakeholder meetings. That you, you all appear to be well beyond that. We grew our stakeholder group to include community outreach folks. We brought in the child care folks, had the individual park authority groups. We had the uh, association groups with all of the student uh, youth uh, athletics and sports. We brought in the high school league and our park authority, and had them all talking about the table about what, what, what it was, how it affected them individually. But we didn't just ask them for what are your issues, but we asked them, give us your issues, give us your concerns, and give us your potential workarounds. What is it that is a showstopper for you? What is it that really is the reason why these time iterations and the amount of time from everything of how long you have access to a field in the evening for your youth groups, to the child care, how long, the middle school programs in the afternoon. And we came down and boiled it down to four options, much like it appears that, and I don't want to be presumptuous, but you're simmering down to a number of different options, including the hybrid options. And then we took those options out to the community, and we had a number of engagement groups where we had, at the time, we had seven clusters. We're now broken up into regions. But we had individual meetings in each of the different areas across Fairfax County where we had people come together and share. And our approach to doing that was much like we do with boundaries. The boundary adjustment process that we have in our communication engagement is one where we talked about the science. We talked about, had an interlude basically from the superintendent, first of all, talking about the importance of the data and the work that we were about, that it is in the best interest of our students, that the data supports it and undergirds what we're all about in our communities, especially in public education. Then we started talking about what individual things we wanted from each of those communities. And we're willing to share our communication plans. We've talked uh, with Montgomery County. They've shared with us about issues and concerns that they have, and we've shared with them about issues and concerns. But in that communication plan, we allowed people to break up in individual groups and work in tables of approximately nine, sometimes 12 people. We had a recorder. And then we had those groups. We talked about the subjects. What do you like about this option? Option one, option two, option three, option four. What are the things that you think are positive? What, do you, what are the pros? What are the cons? But don't just give us your thoughts on it. Give us your recommendations in addition to that. Now, if you have questions, you raise, we gave them little cards, right? You have a question about budget, we had a card for that. You have a question about buses, you raise the yellow, right? The school bus, you raise the yellow card. And we had experts there and facilitators there that would go over to each of these tables if they had questions and help and share the information that we had that we had brought. It allowed it to be a much more effective process a lot more inclusive process, in addition to what you have in your online posting. And all of that data was codified and put onto the website so people could look at it and see what the feedback we were getting. Then at the end of the community meeting, we had folks report out. We had each group stand up and talk about what was important to their group. As I mentioned about each of us are different learners, right? So it allowed for the free flow of information from those that choose to be vocal and those that choose to be more quiet to share in the information 
of the issue that was at hand. And then we had a walk gallery where people just kind of walked along and looked at what people had come up with and posed. Okay, so the challenges we faced, not unlike what you heard, minimizing the cost. We had cost anywhere from 50 some million on down the road. We had like your seven million, you know, your, the caution. I heard the caution, the caution. It's 117, we just want to put it out there. It's a lot of buses and you got a lot of drivers with that too. And just as there's a national shortage of uh, teachers, there's also a national shortage of school bus drivers. So there are challenges that aren't, that aren't, you know, that are just prevalent in our world. We had routing changes that we had to accommodate, much like you were talking about in terms of civil twilight and morning, making sure, and then the sports and the impact on that. I want to go ahead and show you some other things that we have um, on the following subsequent one where we really went through this. And these were the times that we had in the prior year to what we actually in our hybrid in terms of the start. The high schools were about 7.20 a.m. They moved to 8.10 and 8 o'clock and 8.10. Our secondary was 8 a.m. Our secondary schools are the 7 to 12. We have three of which are like that, Robinson, Hayfield, and um, Lake Braddock. And so the middle schools, some people say, okay, well, you just flipped with the middle school. And when we took a look at this, we took a look at the many different options and the community feedback was in support of the hybrid model that we came up with. And we said, we don't want to just have, we had some seven, 725 middle school starts. And we said, okay, if we're going to switch them, the ones that are currently starting at 805, if they're going to be suffering, then we're not going to have them start at 720. So the minimum was going to be 730. So all of the parameters that we set up and all of the things we found out through our process, we were able to go ahead and look at those and see what the impact was on the individual costs associated with it. And then we'll just go on from there because I know you're going to have some questions. This was the end up cost that we had. The initial plan cost was 5.4 million with 47 buses. The revised plan cost was uh, 4.9 million um, with 27 buses, but we bought 20 of the buses in year end funding in the year prior. Uh, our fleet is rather big. It's 1,672, uh, 77 buses. Now what happened? We got a lot of traffic critics. In fact, one of the members of uh, the AAA for the region had come out and said, this is going to be a, a, a gigantic proportions of a nightmare. Um, our class New Bell School is going to be ugly to all the parents and the communities. But in fact, what ended up being the net result was this. Pretty much every school system in our region. And Nikki Burdine is live outside Hayfield Secondary School with more kids getting to sleep in a little uh, longer this morning, right, Nikki? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the good part of this. Kids get to sleep a little bit more. Maybe their parents do too. And guys, you know, I'm always positive, Polly. I try to have an optimistic outlook on life. But today, there's really no getting around it. Today is going to be terrible, at least in terms of traffic. The police say the change in time could actually improve traffic. Parents had children in elementary, middle, and high schools, and they're trying to get from school to school around the same time frame, and they would get stuck up in traffic because everybody else was doing the same. So this may actually help in some areas. But still, a change is coming, one you should be prepared for. Everyone agrees it's hard to predict what rush hour will look like until next week. What a great start we had this week. And I could not be more pleased nor more proud of our wonderful FCPS employees who, um, again, we set a very high standard and put a goal out there and they rose to the challenge. Um, and I told many people, you know, folks were saying the sky was going to fall and things were going to be chaotic and crazy. And, um, and I kept saying, no, it won't. It'll be a smooth start. So as you know, our business is not easy. We will have our critics. We always do. But that's the space in the service of children that we provide for. I can tell you, though, whatever you come up with, engaging in your communities, communicating and over-communicating, and even with some of the issues that we're going to now talk about that we faced as a part of the execution of this, it still is the right thing to do. I wish our traffic looked that clear on a regular day. <laughs> but even after all the criticism, they came back and said it actually worked. It was one of the smoothest starts. And i just like to say that uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And I know Phyllis is here. We talked a little bit about our evolution. We had a great plan as a part of the RFP about the preliminary work plan. And I've got the dates and the weeks that I'd be willing to share for historical purposes. But you've been down that road. The second thing is we talk, had our Bell Schedule Leadership Advisory Group. 
Well, that was a small group we started with that set the general framework, right? Then we expanded that once we started getting some of these cost proposals. Well, you've done that. And then the next part of it is we went and got the CNMC to come in. We didn't need that. Everywhere we went, same thing that you've heard. We understand the medical aspects. We've got that down. That, we don't need to go down that road. Now we need to get about the business, about what this means to our community and what this means to us financially. Then the uh, final thing was the communication plan. And I can't stress enough about how important that was and how the community engagement. You cannot do enough of that in garnering the feedback on the process that you've identified as the potential solutions to this issue. And then the recommendations that finally come before this body for approval. Um, and I, I need to tell you, you've got an expert that's in your community that's one of our staff that uh, Dr. Garza, our superintendent, mentioned. And he's sitting in your audience right now. It's Tom Italiano. And he's one of your residents. And he's one of my right-hand folks that helped me navigate down this road. He's been with our transportation department for an extended period of time, and I can't say enough about him. And you've got a little gem as a part of your community that I'm sure is willing to help you out in this spare time. <laughs> I just want to say one thing. I think that in the communication plan, it is we all here in this room understand the medical science, but unfortunately there are still people in the community, and it's, it's sort of the nature of living in the United States. We all think we can do without sleep. So every communication you put out has to start with, the reason we're talking about this is because the research says that this is the best thing for students, and we're all here trying to figure out a way that will make this work in your community. And that's the discussion has to be about how. You know, we've moved beyond the discussion of whether to do this or not because the research is so clear but it's important to reiterate what the research says so that everyone's starting from the same point in the discussion. So thank you for having us be here. And uh, any questions you might have, we're happy to uh, respond to them as best we can. Todd, I didn't know if you were going to thank say Thank you anything. so much. And now we get to hear from Montgomery. OK. Well, good evening. Um, so for you PowerPoint junkies, you'll be disappointed in me because I didn't bring PowerPoint. Um, and I'm going to be much more narrow in my focus. I want to talk about some of the logistical um, challenges and, and things that need to be thought about as you, as you implement a, a start time change. So we, first of all, you know, money was tight in, in, in this fiscal year and next fiscal year and for each fiscal year thereafter, uh, I'm told. So we were looking for a very low cost option and we decided to go with, in fact, a no cost option. We simply moved our entire school day back 20 minutes. Um, that didn't meet the, the needs or desires of in, in, in totality of really any group, right? Um, there were some people that wanted it to move much further back, some people that didn't want it to move at all. Um, but we decided to go with um, going 20 minutes later. And like I say, the, the key thing about that was that it didn't add any bus routes. We found that as we looked at the various options, the, the big, cost contributor of any of the options was how many additional buses did you need? Um, the other thing that was a, a factor for us was th the, we called it the transportation operating window, right? It's, it's the time from when bus drivers and attendants start in the morning till they finish in the morning, and then when, from when they start in the afternoon till when they end in the afternoon. And as you expand that over a large school bus fleet, it gets expensive. In fact, our costs were, um, we estimated for every 10 minutes additional added to that transportation operating window was about $1.2 million. So it's just paying a lot of people 10 extra minutes over the course of a year adds up. And so we were looking, once again, I say for a no cost option. So we decided to move the day back. But even with such a, a small, relatively small change of 20 minutes, when you apply that over in our case, 156,000 students and their families and 23,000 staff members and the entire community, even that small, relatively small change impacts a lot of lives. And so um, I just want to talk about some of the ways those impacts happen. First of all, we tried to, in addition to moving the all of the bus times back 20 minutes to correspond with the 20 minute later start time, we tried to maximize the opportunities for adolescent student sleep. And so where we had buses that were arriving at high schools 
30 minutes before the bell or in some cases 35 minutes before the bell we tried to move that as close as we could to the high school uh, morning bell and try to have no buses come in earlier than 20 minutes before the high school bell rang well we found that when we moved our morning routes 20 minutes later those early parts of the morning route the high schools and middle schools because our day goes high school middle school and then two different elementary start times when we moved the routes back 20 minutes we found that the same route this year that has the same set of stops and the same set of schools takes longer than it did last year right because many of our high school routes which are our longest we have the we have the, we have the fewest number of high schools or high schools is the smallest number of schools that we have so they have the longest routes on average we found that when we move those long routes um, 20 minutes closer to the heart of rush hour that it just took longer to perform the routes and so that was one of the the challenges that we faced and so even what you would think is you just take all your bus schedules right change all the times 20 minutes later and life is good right it's just a piece of cake well when the routes start taking longer each individual piece you know most of our um, traditional neighborhood regular education buses do a high school and middle school and then two two different elementary start times when you move that back 20 minutes and those pieces start taking longer now all the pieces of the bus routes don't fit together like they did last year right and while our special education routes change considerably from year to year for the most part our regular education routes don't well now you suddenly have routes that they don't fit together the pieces don't fit together like they did last year and so routes that have been tweaked down to as close to perfection as we can get them over many 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 years right now suddenly don't work and need to be adjusted well you may think that's a relatively small problem except for when you apply it over 1140 routes right it takes quite a bit of logistics to make the new mix fit right and and e even things like well sally's always been my bus driver right she uh, sally transported my kids and 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 um and and they transported me and they transported my parents right because sally's always driven out of this neighborhood well now sally's route doesn't work because of the new times and so now sally can't drive out of that neighborhood and so things that you i just want to say that things that you may not think of as large changes right and they probably aren't on an individual basis individual case basis when you apply that across uh, a school system there are things that you might not anticipate that that are just uh, some of them I don't even want to call problems but they're just challenges that that need to be commun addressed by communication or um, just lots of timing had to be tweaked the other thing we we found that when we when we tried to get kids arriving at schools as close to the bell time as possible we found that schools had developed programs for kids that would come in and be there before school they did tutoring they did um, chances to meet with individual individually with teachers certainly there were breakfast programs that now as we try to get kids there closer to the bell time now suddenly some folks are saying to us hey we don't have time to eat breakfast now and so while you're thinking you're doing a good thing in terms of maximizing you know opportunities for morning sleep or allowing them to get out of bed later you're pressing up against some things that used to be norms okay in the afternoon we found that um, kind of the opposite uh, situation occurred in the morning it was our early routes that took longer now that we moved them later in the day well in the afternoon you know the early the the high school and middle school routes are help happening well before rush hour but now when you move back 20 minutes the elementary bus routes are now getting closer to rush hour okay so now they're taking longer we have a we have a um, every school system or almost every school system I know of has a um, uh, a window after their their p.m. dismissal bell at which time they promise the buses will arrive well in Montgomery County that's 20 minutes we promise that every bus will be there within 20 minutes of the of the dismissal bell um, so we continue to to enforce that promise and we don't we uh, wherever we had buses that were arriving later than 20 minutes we fixed those we did whatever we had to to address those but we now are using that 20 minute window more than we did last year right because as the routes now take longer because they're closer to rush hour um, 
it is requiring us in some cases where we had maybe a school where all the buses were sitting waiting at the bell time. Well, now maybe half the buses are sitting waiting at bell time and half are coming five minutes or seven minutes or 10 minutes later than that. Um, and so one of the one of the impacts on people's lives that that is not popular in every case is that as elementary students are getting home later in the day, we've heard from some families that now we're pressing up against the rest of the rest of the life of that family, right? That they used to go to not so much with school related activities, but after school community activities, right? Soccer teams and Hebrew school and, and guitar lessons and things like that. It used to be that that families had time to uh, for for little Johnny to get off the bus, right? And then hop in the family minivan and go off to these activities. Well, now now we're kind of pressing up against those, not only because of the 20 minute shift, but because of the 20 minute shift and now the bus routes are taking longer, right? So it might be uh, a 30 minute change or a 35 minute change, which in some cases is just enough to press up against the afternoon activities of that family. And so these aren't, these aren't monumental problems, right? But these are, these are things to be considered as you, as you move into this and things that that need to be talked about up front, I believe, and, and just impacts to, to know are coming. Um, I've, I've talked to a number of people over the course of this, the start of this school year, because um, our adjustment, you know, every school system has this, every transportation department in a school system has this adjustment period at the beginning of the school year, right? That, that you do your best to anticipate exactly what it's gonna look like, but this bus has too few too many students and this one has not quite enough and so you shift them around. And that process normally takes us about two weeks. Well, with the, with the bell time shift this, this year, that process took us about a month to get through the, the bulk of those changes. Um, and one of the things that I, that I shared with people as they called with concerns about the timing of their bus and whatever, and they couldn't understand why such a simple change of 20 minutes may have resulted in a bus that doesn't make it to middle school on time or, or whatever that we had to adjust. I asked each person to, that I had this discussion with, I said, I don't know where you commute to, but imagine if tomorrow you leave 20 minutes later, right? What would that do to your commute? And most people said, oh yeah, I really didn't think about that, right? If my commute now is 45 minutes, if I leave 20 minutes later, my commute's an hour and 15 minutes, right? And so people kind of, they related to that th through that, that simple example. And so I had that discussion lots of times at the beginning of the school year, and it just helped people to relate. So I would say that our, our relatively simple change of moving back 20 minutes um, has more of a, of an impact than you would think when you spread it over an entire school system community. And, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any of your specific questions, even about the, pro the process like Jeff talked about or whatever, as much as I can answer those. But um, I just wanted to start out with those, that little bit of information about what the logistical impact is. Thank you all of you very much. We prepared some board questions in advance. Um, but we'll, I'm sure we'll also have ones that have cropped up, but I will go ahead and open the dais to my colleagues who had questions um, to go ahead and begin asking. Who, do you want to go first, Allison? <laughs> your, your question's the first one on here. Um, one of my first questions is for our own, our own staff, and that's, Currently, at this moment in time, we've resolved to change school times, and we have allotted $600,000 from the county council, from the community, to make that change. That change is associated with a 30-minute shift. So if we do a 30-minute shift, and you outlined beautifully the impacts of that, we didn't get really specific in the about the actual number of elementary schools that will be impacted by, I believe, an extraordinary late time to start school and end school. And by my rough estimation, it's about 43 schools would start after 9.15. And while we haven't decided that schools should start or should end by 4.15, but that impacts our elementary students and their families and the teachers that teach at those schools a great deal. And with a growing um, 
I know we've talked about Parks and Rec can come in and do before care, but with a growing farms population in this county, that puts a financial burden onto our parents. And I just want to be able to air that publicly, that this impacts a lot of families in the community. I don't know if you want to read out how many students exactly, but it's a lot. It's more than half of our elementary schools. So, um, Mr. Dykstra, who's in charge of our instructional data division, executive director of instructional data, tells me that there's about uh, 28,000 students in 55 schools, elementary, that start after 9 o'clock, 9, 10 in the morning, and about 3,300 students at middle school level that start after 9, 10 in this, in this mode. That's if um, we were to do the 30-minute shift. That's how many it would affect. And so your, your comment, Mrs. Picard, the, about the, uh, the daycare in the morning, I mean, the Start Times Task Force did hear that. We did hear that daycare would be a necessity for many more parents who currently can stay home with an 8.30 or a 9 o'clock start, you know, or almost 9 o'clock, anywhere in that window. But once you start edging after 9 o'clock, then they can no longer stay home and take their own student. So it is a concern, and we did talk to many local daycare providers from all geographic regions of the county, and they did tell us that they would need notice if we were going to do this um, to shift their resources and build capacity in some cases to take on more morning care that they currently don't have capacity for. But, you know, they were willing to take, take on the charge and the challenge if we gave them enough time. But it is an issue. Your, your comment about uh, our students who live in poverty, yes, that is an issue and, and it would be an issue and we would have to think about that long and hard, how we would manage the mornings uh, the opportunity for those students who wouldn't be transported until much later in the morning. That is an issue, absolutely. Can, and in that same vein, my set part two of that question is when elementary school students start that late in the day, we have cultural arts that have to be, so there's students, elementary students that wouldn't be getting their math and their reading and their language arts until after lunch. And I can tell you with three children, my children start to fade after lunch, and I, I think that's really, we have a huge emphasis and a major priority on our elementary education right now, and pre-K and early education and our triple E, and I think that's doing, doing us a, a, a disservice. I just, again, want to make sure the public understands the ripple effect of a 30-minute shift. So that's another great question you ask, and, and we were really concerned about that too, and, and Mrs. Nally, you've asked that on, on multiple occasions. Absolutely, and, and so we really looked into that, and so uh, uh, Michelle Batten, who's our Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction, a former elementary principal, if you would like to address that, Michelle. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. So you can see by this sample model, looking at this particular schedule, we have a lot of time for our, our core academic schedule to begin in that first hour resulting in a shift of our cultural arts block in that second hour and then on down per grade level. This would require uh, availability of additional cultural arts teachers in order to make this happen. Um, and you can also see that each grade level is allotted collaboration time for that planning for each grade level to meet um, classroom teachers to meet um, and continue that collaborating time. So the good news there is we were challenged with, could you do it? And the answer is, we can do it. We can make sure that students come and they get right into their academic core, whether it be reading, mathematics, science, social studies, and have cultural arts in recess later in the day. We can do it. It does require a flexibility that we don't currently use with our elementaries, which means that you can see with third grade and kindergarten, cultural arts is happening at the same time. That means two different blocks of cultural arts teams operational in the school at the same time. And that's a flexibility that we would have to move toward if we were going to uh, have elementary schools opening late. Mrs. Nally. <clears throat> wow. I, um, that would be very, be very interesting logistically, too, in building space. I'm just thinking of a kind of a nightmare. It would, and in fact, 
um, one of our principals that we talked to, a, a, a large school principal who was a late school, said she would have to give it a lot of thought. She could make it happen, but it would have to be a lot of thought and might require a portable. I mean, it, yes, there are different, different variables would come into the solution than historically have come into the solution of our cultural arts moving around. Sure. My other, uh, I thought Mr. Watkins brought up a very, another, uh, very interesting when he mentioned the impact of just 20 minutes later, um, because we all know in this county that we have pockets of high traffic. Uh, I look in Annapolis, and, and it's very true. If I leave at my house, and I, I live near the Naval Academy, if I leave at 4 o'clock, the Academy, North Severn, they're all letting out. If I go down where my grandchildren live, near when St. Mary's School is letting out, and they're all in the Academy, Naval Academy, and then you, when the government's in, it is massive. So my thought is you move some of these uh, elementary schools up, 15 or 20 minutes, as Mr. Watkins mentioned, you've got to make sure you're going to look at the impact of the traffic, because I think that what Mr. Watkins said is it's going to be more than that 20 or 30 minutes in the afternoon that you see for some of those elementary schools. I think we're going to have to be real careful about that, looking at those traffic. Fort Meade area, I mean, it's, it's really, we have some pockets. So we have our Director of Transportation here. Mr. Douglas, would you like to address oh, that? Oh, we're issue? nice Nice to see you. Welcome. <laughs> You've just stepped right into this. <laughs> uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> so basically what Mrs. Nelly is saying is that we would, in the late afternoons, if we have more buses on the roads in the late afternoons or when we move sure. to people, we're going to have different traffic patterns. Well, I would, I would concur with what Todd said in that that 20 minutes is crucial. Uh, 20 minutes could become 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And in certain very, very small pockets, 20 minutes mm -hmm. could become even longer than that. Yes. Um, so, so, yes, that's a, uh, but these are, um, th these are, types of problems that I think can be worked out. We, there, um, I, I, think, I think as we go through the evening, we're going to find some, some more, um, uh, well, some larger issues that we need to speak about. But, but yeah, that it, it, it is an issue um, that 20 minutes can become 40 minutes. And you're right, around Annapolis, uh, other parts of the county, um, you know, it's splotchy around the county. And those are already late schools. I speak of Annapolis Elementary being always already one of our latest schools. So if you push that school back, of course, I've got grandchildren there, guys, so that's why I'm very concerned, too. But, uh, you know, it's really a... Sure. Oh, absolutely. Around the Annapolis area mm -hmm. and other... And, and, and you're right. Once government's in, it's going to be even worse. Yes. So. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Burge. Thank you. Um, I want to clarify something that you mentioned earlier, which was that... Um, and um, when the, the schedule was up. So a schedule like this wouldn't necessarily cost extra for buses, <laughs> but it would cost extra for teachers. And maybe portable. It may cost extra for teachers. It may just be a flexible notion of how we have to use our current teachers in ways that we don't currently use them. So it might take some intellectual thought, but, but it in fact may increase the number of FTE we need. Okay, so that was that was part of it. I also, um, when um, Mr. Watkins was talking about the elementary school, um, I, I, I seem to think that we must have a longer school day than other school districts because they were their latest was starting at 9:20 and would still get out at 3:50. Is that sound right? Which is six hours and 45 minutes. And what about Montgomery? Okay, and how long is ours? 6.3 hours in elementary. Okay, so... 378 minutes a day. <laughs> that means something I'm to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, my fifth grader is working on long division right now. I can't do it in my head. Um, so, w one of the things, I know Miss Pickard was talking about some of the problems at the beginning of the day. And one of the things that I've brought up for the last several years that we've talked about this, I'm more concerned 
about the end of the day for our elementary school students because my children used to go to one of those schools that started at nine o'clock and they already didn't get out until 340 and didn't get home until after four o'clock and I know everyone's gonna think this is crazy but at the time my kids went to bed at about 7 or 730 when they were in early elementary school and a lot of elementary school kids you're talking about kindergartners go to bed early I mean 730 might be a reasonable bedtime for a kindergartner um, so if you're talking about an ele a kindergartner getting out of school at 415 they might not get home until almost five o'clock on their bus and then they might go to bed two and a half hours later. So they have two and a half hours for dinner, playing, homework, which we give our kindergartners, and soccer practice. And that's not long enough for that. And so I'm wondering how we chose 4.15 as the latest end time and not something earlier. So if you'll um, glance over here to the dismissal and the civil twilight and the civil twilight beginning and the civil twilight ending, what we have said is we don't want students walking in the dark. And so the latest we can really go is about a 415 end and still know that if students are walkers or if they're bus riders with a walk after, they'll basically get home before we get deep into civil twilight. And so that's, that's the notion of the latest. Now, we pushed many, many schools prior to that you know, so that it's not huge numbers going all the way to 415. But it is 55 of the, of the elementaries that would start after 910, which would get them into that, that late afternoon. Right. So. I mean, I just feel like in that case, the only thing that we really looked at was the was that kind of safety, and we missed the other important issues that we were supposed to be touching on for all of our students, like family time and and those sorts of things. Because getting a child home at close to five o'clock, especially a young child, is really it's really wrecking their their family time. So although C was an option, the task force, as Ms. Lane talked about, the task force really looked hard at the fact that it does change the family dynamic, it does change the culture of a family, and we would have to deal with that, absolutely. And so I don't want to tell you it was missed. Okay. It was not missed, and the, if anyone would like to comment that was on the task force, we talked about that long and hard. But we put it forth as an option because it did move our adolescent start time to a later start. And it was the most cost sensible one at the moment, right? We we're making that rec uh, option, bringing it forward to you. Thank you. Mrs. Ritchie. Um, thank you all for being here, appreciate it. A uh, couple of things, one, did we ever think about is there a law that says we have to start high school first? I mean, can we start high school after middle school and elementary school? There's no reason we couldn't start high school at the end. So, I mean, that's something that I didn't see in any of the options and stuff. So that's, that's you know, another thing. And um, I know that that then bumps up to some of the later athletic pieces. But as been mentioned before, you know, we're in the business of academics. And so people have to give and take and and so forth like that. So... That also doesn't impact the middle schools because, again, you know, we've got some teenagers, young te kids there that, you know, in seventh and eighth grade that are having that sleep problem as well. So, but not doing any shifts at all other than taking them high school and putting them at the end. So, so we, we looked at that. It was option A and B. So in option A, the high schools would start at, well, no, in B, the high, the, it's B more in that. Yeah. Yeah. For the the um, flip model where the high school started after the middle schools and the elementary schools are relatively left unchanged. So that that option has been proposed for you. Okay, so you shifted the times for the middle schools? 
So the, in this option, the high schools began 118 minutes later, beginning at 915. Okay. And the middle schools began 20 minutes earlier. <laughs> and the elementary schools start about 5 to 10 minutes earlier. Okay. So that's... And what was the cost of that? $9.4 million. Okay. Um, so then the other piece of that is when you brought through all these options, there was an option in there about the hybrid piece. How close are we to doing online? How close is... I mean, is that something we're going to do like next year? I, I mean, how close are we to doing that? So I will tell you we have the ability to do online learning. It exists right now in Anne Arundel County. To do it with the number of students that we're proposing, we wouldn't be starting next year. We could do it in a pilot phase starting next year. But the sheer numbers of students online at once would require us to have a platform that we, had, we don't have at this time. And now, Dr. Lotto, I don't know if you want to add to that. <laughs> when, when, when we were talking about that part of it, did we speak to the students about it? And, and what was their takeaway? Because, I mean, we had 2,000 people who responded, which is a large amount for, for us. But of, the, of just that specific piece, how many of the students wanted to do that? So Ms. Gray Hawkins will bring that up for you. So you see that option D from the student, and there were only 191 students that you yeah. know, but that's still significant. Um, option really. D was still, you know, only at 4%. Right. Now, when we looked at what they said, in many cases what they would say is, I'm not exactly sure how this would work, because it is a fairly different option for us, right? So it could be an issue of them not fully understanding, but I will tell you that students are voting with their feet. Ms. Lane can talk to you about alternative ed and night school and how many students have moved in the last year to online learning. When we just started at Evening High School last spring and offering online options to some of our most non-traditional learners who have struggled and not even passed the class on the first time. And in one year, we've gone to 96 courses offered to um, several hundred students in, in just two semesters. So they're, they're very interested, and they're being quite successful. Okay, well, then that's the next part is because how successful are they? And that's over the, the period of time because you have to have a lot of dedication and, and willpower to do something like that. You can't wait till the, you know. In this which, hybrid option um, that Dr. McMahon referenced, the students would come in um, in the uh, second period, halfway through the second period. So they do it an online option whenever they so chose. Right. And then in the second period of the day, they'd come in and have face-to-face -face contact with an instructor for the second 45 minutes of this of uh, period two so we would be getting daily face to face with them while they were doing their online mm. option and then we'll also eventually be helped with the community college because as we move into this college and career readiness one of the pieces is that many more students may be choosing to attend the community college well that attending of the community college may happen in a face-to-face -face, a hybrid or an online environment so some of the offerings here might also uh, be something that Anne Arundel Community College would offer. And while I appreciate all the work that the task force did and all the options that were out there, the problem is there's no clear winner in there. There's no clear one that says that this is what the community overwhelmingly wants. Now, I'm not, I'm not foolish to believe that we will ever get that, but the, but the problem and, and maybe the, the thing when we start going, you know, even a little deeper into this is y you get three options and that's what you get. We can't, we can't do this where we have, I like option A and half of option B and some of the options, because that really, what that does to me is then say, there's no clear winner, and so therefore I don't want to make any changes, because I can irritate one-third of the people, or I can irritate two-thirds of the people, and, and so you know, that's what's going to end up happening, and while it's not our business to make sure that we're making people happy, we're making sure where kids are educated, but the problem is, is that I really don't want all those nasty emails telling me what a moron I am, to be quite honest. Um, but but I also but I also know that that when we give too many of those options like that, it's just, I, I appreciate what the Fairfax people were talking about when they were talking about that roundtable, that last little bit. I think that was that's something that we really 
need to look into and making sure we have a representative not from our traditional groups of the CAC and, and so forth, but making sure there's representatives from every single school in our county that can come there, you know, and having the option to do that because then we really start to get some real, I, I think that when, when we start really having a serious conversation, we're gonna start really hearing a lot more from people who didn't because they don't see it happening. But when we start talking to elementary parents, all of a sudden the groundswell is going to be elementary parents coming out and going, I don't want my kids coming home any later than that. For exactly those reasons that Ms. Burge talked about, I don't want them coming home at, you know, and then two hours later having to go to bed. And and then the last and final one for me is, is having to do with what we haven't even talked about yet is some of the bus transportation, some of the bus issues. And so, you know, maybe we have an opportunity, we can have our representatives talk a little bit about hiring, um, training, so, so forth like that so that we can get a little understanding about that because I know that that's a another big major hurdle none of this is insurmountable and doesn't mean it's not going to happen but it certainly is I know we we did have a question about as one of um, our guests said the bus driver shortage what it what it's like here in Anne Arundel and also shortage of available buses sure uh, Randall job jobs bus service I appreciate you guys having me come down um, the i think the the bus driver uh, shortage issue is uh, as we spoke you can read any of the publications school bus fleet it's a nationwide type thing there's a um, ongoing problem with that that we're we're currently dealing with so any additional buses would certainly need some time to do that there's a process that goes uh, involved in uh, hiring a school bus driver that you guys no, any from background check to CDL driver uh, to um, all, all the uh, uh, um, qualifications that they do through the board of uh, through the uh, county um, certification process too. So there's a time factor to get that many people and to get them ready because we're currently working on that every day, and that's a tough thing for a lot of our companies to do. We're we're uh, r usually running right about the max for any sub drivers we have and, and, and the normal things going that, that go along with that. It's kind of hard to have, um, you know, if you operate 50 buses, it's hard to have 25 spare drivers. I mean, it, it would be nice, but you can't pay them to be there. So you end up having five or six or whatever, and then you use them up. So to, to do that, there has to be plenty of time to get those people in place. Uh, uh, did that answer your question? I, w I would think I would think it would be a challenge, as with anyone, but uh, anything. But like you say, it's not something we couldn't overcome. Um, so, uh, from the time somebody says yes, I'd like to work for you and be a bus driver, how much time do you generally need to process them and get them certified? Well, well, there's a lot of people come to my office that say yes they like to be a bus driver but about 20 percent only make it so that, that that's between our screening and the screening it goes through so it is it's a it's a month and a half to two months if that person uh is is diligent about able to get a cdl license all right anything else anything else debbie and, and these guys can, can okay um I have a question based on that because the the way I envision something happening, I, I'm personally not in favor of just a straight shift that would just make things later. I mean, you could probably tell that by me being concerned about elementary school students. So essentially what I would envision is more of a compressed start and end time than what we have now. But that leads me to believe that some of your drivers who now may run, do three or four runs, might not get to do three or four runs anymore. And I'm wondering how you think that would impact your ability to recruit and retain drivers if, it, they're, it, if they're doing fewer runs each. Uh, uh, if time becomes less for employees, it's always a factor. It would have a great impact. Uh, we try to offer some minimums you know, for, for them for that but it does uh it, it would affect them and it would be hard to continue to get people if the times 
or, or less. In other words, uh, an average bus driver might be six and three quarter hours a day, morning and afternoon run. And then of course, if you're gonna cut that to six, that's, that, that, that would impact us on current drivers. So that, okay. to answer that question. Because I, I did notice, I, I live in Odenton, and okay. one, one of the bus companies is advertising on our local florist that they're looking for bus drivers right now, $18 an hour. So um, yes. <laughs> apparently uh, they're looking real hard right now, and there's yes, a problem are. even as it, as it stands. It is. Good <laughs> qualified people, so it's tough. Mrs. Nally. You may not be able to answer this, but we have purchased transportation software. Do you have any thoughts on if you think that will would greatly uh, help in, uh, in 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 doing the bus routes? This transportation software—it's been done by hand before, and I know you guys know that. Well, bus I route. I think the staff you have that's done it for years, that's down there, that at a transportation division, the contractors that you're currently using in the county do. I mean, I'm tooting my own horn, but they do an excellent job without that. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's an amazing process, but it's a, a well old machine, and I've seen it, you know, over the years. I mean, I've I've been around it a long time, but you mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, they they do do a great job. I would ask that question to Mr. Watkins that had uh, have installed their GPS, and did you guys run a mock run? Uh, of that to help with analyzing cost? So we've been using transportation routing software since the early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't fully implemented for probably about the first five years, but we've been using it since then. The The illusion that it that it is automated routing is, is in fact an illusion, right? We do the bulk of our routing by hand, and we use the, the transportation software to to electronically store, to run models. So we were able to last year um, and, the, and the years prior, as we were contemplating bell time changes, we were able to use that electronically stored data to say, well, what if we shifted bell times this way or that way? And the, and the, the software did a good job of helping us estimate how many additional routes it would take um, with each uh, iteration of the bell times. But to think that you're going to move to a routing software and suddenly gain tremendous efficiencies in your routing, I, I believe is a myth. Um, I, we, do, we do most of our routing by hand. We have routing experts that, that are very good at routing. They know the areas. They know what is a safe bus stop location and what isn't. The software doesn't know that. Um, they know what have been the historical trends in, in um, bus usage in your neighborhoods. Um, the transportation software doesn't know that. So if you if you try that, they all offer a, a, a one button routing solution, right? You push the button and poof, it makes all the routes. There are many, many pitfalls to that approach. And so I think that if you move to routing software, you will still find that you're, that the folks that are doing such a good job routing now will still be doing that good job routing and they will, um, they will have some advantages from doing it through a software but the big advantages are cataloging it and, and, and the ability to quickly get data and some modeling of what new bell times are. But, but it will not replace that expertise, in my opinion. Jeff? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, you know, I really appreciate hearing uh, my brother Todd talking about some of these things because it's like we should be paying you for our therapy session <laughs> on all the issues that we face in transportation because they're real. But, but these challenges are all also opportunities. This can be done. The routing software, it enhances a process. It vets where you've done and out, where staff have been doing an outstanding job over time that know those, those specific elements and the stops that, that Todd was so eloquently talking about. But it does enhance the process. The deal is there is no silver bullet. There is no one size fits all. Each of these issues and concerns that are being raised, all legitimate and all reflective of your communities, have to be navigated and worked through to the best extent possible. Routing software will aid those staff personnel that are so talented, that know the communities, that know the turns, that know the landscape of the roads. It's an enhancement. It's not, a, it's not to eliminate anything. But, but to suggest that these things aren't also opportunities, I, I just feel compelled to say that. 
because as much as I'm getting the relief of all the same experiences that we've had, um, it is a change. It is a significant change. And leadership around change helps maintain that calm and that's why I stress the communication, communication, communication. Because it enhances your process of leading this change, of addressing the elementary late issue, so that you minimize the impacts that Todd articulated very well. The ones that we've experienced. The extension in the change. You think about the number of students he mentioned. We, our ridership at the high school level, at the secondary level, has increased 4,000 students than the previous year. Now, we haven't grown that much in our student enrollment, folks. And so the deal is there's some unanticipated healthy aspects that are causing a drag on our system as well. So change is not without experiential components that will create challenges. The key is, as has been stated, is to identify the environment we're in, identify all the challenges afoot, and articulate them and try to address them as best we can as you continue to move forward. One at a time. Because it can be done, yeah. And if you, if you don't do it in a process or procedural manner, it can be overwhelming and it can be paralyzing. But the reality is working together, bringing your communities in, it really helps identify and assuage a lot of those concerns. But good points and good conversation. I just want to make the point. So Jeff mentioned we've got more high school students riding the buses this year because they're starting at 810 instead of at 720. And what that also means, I have heard from several of the high schools, neighbors of the high schools, there is less car traffic around the high schools as a result because there are fewer students driving to school. So that's an unintended benefit that we weren't necessarily anticipating. You know, we're hearing the kids talk about having time for breakfast before they go to school, and we all know how important it is to eat breakfast before school. So we have high school students and their families saying it's so great to hear, to, to be able to spend time with my high school student in the morning and have breakfast before they go to school. The mornings are less rushed, they're calm, they're happy during the day. The teachers are saying things like, it's not just first thing in the morning that the students are more pleasant. The students are more pleasant. The school environment in the high school is more pleasant all day long because that rest that the students are getting and the fact that they're coming to school at a time of day when it's light outside and they're alert and they're awake and they're ready to learn, what is more important than that? So yes, there are challenges and each and every challenge can be resolved and you know they can because other districts have done it other districts with weird traffic problems and I mean what is worse than Fairfax County I don't hey. <laughs> in terms of traffic okay so you know and I'm hearing from people who said they thought it was going to be awful and then their commute was faster so things adjust and for every problem we're seeing there is a workaround for it. And maybe the slide isn't the best option if you're talking about elementary schools having to start at 955. But you've got other more creative options. And then there are solutions to each of the problems that comes up. So, I mean, sports scheduling was a huge thing in Fairfax. And Jeff worked really closely with the community leagues and he's a little bit modest. I mean, one of the things that happened with our new superintendent and new transportation and facilities leader is that they started to rebuild trust in the community so that I'm sitting here next to him, which is like surreal to me after working on this for 11 years and writing those angry emails because my kids didn't get later high school start times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no more nasty emails to Deborah Ritchie. Okay. <laughs> so George. But it can be positive and you can be getting lots of thank you emails. Right. So going to working to some of those solutions um, so that everybody's aware um, and I'd love to get some comments from our from the folks in Fairfax and, and Montgomery also. 
So we operate with, with bus companies, right? We don't own fleets of buses like the numbers that these two districts do, right? So we, we work through, through vendors like you all that are able to provide. So one of the things the, con the board has talked about for a number of months now, um, uh, well over a year, is one of the concerns or um, uh, something we have to find a solution to is your, ab your ability to access buses. Right. And so if at some point when, the, it, when we move and we're probably going to need more equipment on the road and we go to our vendors, what's a time frame for you like in your world where, where you're going to – we're going to need to give you enough time where you can go out not only and get the drivers mm -hmm. and the aids for those buses, but you actually have to get the equipment. And what's that time frame That's like a, for you all? That would be the easy part, the equipment. Okay. <laughs> ah. so, so can you give us an idea of the work? Because we Certainly. talked about this, so we could talk uh, about uh, the, the, the logistics of you all getting the additional bus. Yes. Uh, placing order, you know, and on our regular uh, renewal from, for bus contracts with Anne Arundel County, the bid process, usually from January, take the, uh, be award something, can then place order, take delivery, in August, so we're talking seven to eight months to get a bus ordered and delivered. Okay. Uh, well, it's a bid process in Anne Arundel County, so we all would uh, individual companies would get. To answer that question from a county standpoint, it's probably, it, it varies from year to year. 40 to 50 buses go out for bid. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. I don't know what the average is. Different contractors may have to get five, some 10, you know, it varies depending on the amount of contracts you were able to uh, secure. So each contractor say five, but uh, the county overall, and uh, an average of 50, I'm guessing, but that's about right, I think. Okay. While we while we're on transportation, I just had a couple questions. Uh, a clarification for the hybrid option: those students that decide to do online first and then come in during second period, are they responsible for their own transportation to school, or would we run another bus? No, we would transport them. We built in the transportation for them. And has anybody considered, um, or did any of you all consider? starting say high school and middle school at the same time and sharing the buses so students would be on the middle and high school students would be on the bus together oh commingling yeah we, we had uh we had some that were coupled in fact one of their one of the requests was to decouple them um so we kind of went the opposite way um the school district that i was in prior um had the secondaries all starting at about the same time so there was enough of a fleet that was and it was uh, owned and operated by the school division that they had enough of a fleet and enough drivers that they could have all the elementary start at one time There's 80,000 student school district and all of the secondary start within close proximity um, But we didn't we didn't take a look at uh, going ahead and commingling um, the middle school and the uh, high schools um, as one of the you know, options we before Jeff got to Fairfax they did actually look at Putting some of the middle and high schools together and then they also did one South County did that split start because they had a facility over an overcrowded facility so interestingly what they found was that by having them at separate times it was less expensive because they're using I mean it's all about even use of the buses you want to use each bus three times if possible and so you could put your middle and high school together at one time and then have a different middle and high school together at a different time and it would be a good efficient use of the buses but if you have all the middle and high schools all going at exactly the same time then you're using probably twice as like if you have your separate tier high schools on one tier and middle schools on one tier now and there's an even number of buses if you decide you're going to put them all at the same time you're going to have that many more buses does that make sense and we know our secondary, in our secondary schools the three secondary schools i mentioned that are seven through twelve they all come in at the same time so for example lake bragg secondary i have 49 buses delivering at the same time which is a sporting opportunity so I mean, we do have that at the at the three secondary schools. And that's why that we, we have. put them at eight instead of eight. Right, 10. exactly, and that's why they're at a different time. 
Jeff, I think you should suggest she come to work for you. Uh, um, she has a pretty good understanding of the system. Um, but so, that's that's the big problem, though, is not not the mixing of the students. We have a we have one of our uh, clusters where we do that now because it's, it's so rural and it just makes sense to bus them together. But you, you, you essentially double the the need for buses, and so the price just is astronomical. It's all. I mean, when you get these price tags, what you need to ask is. Why is it 7.9 million? What's the peak bus use? How many and why? What are the schools that are in that time frame? And could any of them be moved out? You know, are there special programs that are there that don't necessarily have to be there? I mean, we had to ask a lot of very specific questions to bring the price down. You know, we'd hear from the transportation people, well, the developmentally disabled students, you know, they have to go at 720 because they've always gone at 720 and they need to get to their job sites to do their work. And then we kept asking, well, why, why do they have to get there at 720, you know, and go back to transportation. Transportation goes back to the program and says, well, is it possible? You know, could you change that? And the answer is, oh, yeah, we'd love to change it. We didn't think we had the option. So actually those students were getting to work before the work was ready for them. And so that's what we mean by every challenge is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Hummer. I'd yes, like no, my turn. Pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, so um, just bringing back to the money. So we're talking 600,000 to change for 30 minutes. But from what I'm hearing, we might have to increase the number of teachers for cultural arts or portables or things. That will be, that's another potential cost that if would come we, on. If we were moving the late elementaries in to uh, end before 415, right. we have some issues. So that would be additional cost on top of our 600,000. Possibly, we haven't looked at that in gory detail yet. Right, so. but that's a, a potential. And then also, I hadn't thought of this, but y'all brought up that you have 4,000 more high school students that are coming. So that's a potential that we may need more buses because if we are suddenly find an increase in, that's another potential cost that we could come up with if we, and one we can't really predict until it we comes We plan down. right now though to transport our high schools you know in other words when we build bus schedules we plan based on total ridership okay so all right it does I will say that that does fluctuate during the course of the year depending on when certain sports start yeah. so there are a number of things that change but it was just and we had accounted for it as well so I didn't okay. want to mislead you in that so now for Fairfax now I know all the studies point to that the optimum start time for adolescents is 830 middle schoolers are also adolescents but y'all have actually made it a little earlier for your middle schoolers at 7 30. is there a plan to move that to a later time in the future because it seems that they're they're not getting the benefits of the added sleep so our school district still wants to work on it there's not a set plan for specifically how how or when but yes they want to work on it it's definitely it was a trade-off but every child in our school system will have less time at the 720. Uh, so how do I put this? In the old days, we had many cohorts of students that had 720 for all six years, seventh through 12th grade, because we have secondary schools that started at 720. We had some other schools that were starting middle school at 725, some at 730, some at 740. We had some that started as late as 805. So some of the cohorts of seventh graders have benefited with the change mm -hmm. and others have you know, been harmed. Mm -hmm. That said, every student going through the school system only has two years in middle school and four years in high school. So overall, we've had a huge improvement. We have some students, the secondary school students, never start before 8 o'clock in their entire FCPS careers. Then we have other students that now have, you know, two years of 730 instead of four years of 720. So that was the trade-off. But overall, it's huge improvement for every single student going through our school system. And but y'all are still looking into possibly in the future tweaking that more yes okay. but I think that 
we felt like this was a big change and this was a huge improvement. So put that in place, work out the bugs, you know, find out where the problem areas are and then go from there to improve it. And, and, and also there's a desire to move some of our, some of our elementary schools are starting at 920. And we also would like to see that moved, you know, closer to nine o'clock. But it's a gradual, can't do it all at once. All right, one of, our, one of the issues that we're looking at, because I'm reading on earlier things, evening school, would this change? Um, I, one of the early reports on start times had said that it could affect the number of classes that students are able to take in evening school. What's the, if we move back, because it will cut into the time for teachers and students? Right, so the later the high schools get out, so for example, in, in option um, B, where the high schools start at 9.15 and don't end till four. Mm -hmm. Currently, evening high school starts at three o'clock and goes till nine, and the students are able to take the four classes just as they would during day school. But if we did, weren't able to start evening high school until 4.30 or five, we likely would only be able to offer three classes a night, which would limit the opportunities for a credit accrual for our students attending evening high school. And magnet programs. We have extended day for a number of our magnet programs. I know my son currently doesn't get home until after six. And if we move the start time, we're gonna, I mean, he'll be, who knows what time he'll get home <laughs> if, we, if we move that start time later. So Mrs. Talar, uh, Assistant Superintendent for Advanced Studies and Programs will address that. So as you know, many of the magnet programs have extended day options that are required because they're part of the curriculum. Instructional delivery is occurring that allows the child to really delve into the interest area of the magnet program. So by pushing the day back, indeed, extended day would be pushed back as well. So they wouldn't be getting out early. We'd continue with the fidelity of the program. They keep the fidelity, but they would be. So we're looking at some, the magnet programs would, would be probably hit them. into the civil twilight ending period. Oh, I mean, I'm thinking a half an hour change, like my son, it would be set close to seven before he gets home is what we Potentially want. with a, you know, a drop off at the consolidated bus mm -hmm. stops, which right. are mostly the libraries, right. it could be late in, later into the twilight. That's true. Right. The two hour change? Oh, it could be. I can't imagine. Now, it would be nice if he wasn't catching the bus at 545, but it's kind of it's on the other end right we exactly. wouldn't want to hurt the instructional quality of the program right well and we, because it would invalidate what we're trying to do with the magnet programs exactly it's a wonderful right. program we don't want to cut right. into that but it is a factor to consider because that's a significant number of our students that are would be impacted Absolutely. with that that longer day and um all right that's all for me did you Was look at having different high schools start at different times i mean not yet <laughs> I was just thinking, I mean, there's no rule that says every high school has to start at exactly the same time either. And that, in terms of those bus tiers? Mrs. Picard. So we, the task force, just to answer that, the task force did not look at that due to uh, co-curricular, extracurricular and sports in Ann Arundel County. Ending all at the same time allows us to be more flexible with the sports schedule. We, we talked to some experts in jurisdictions across the country and we talked to the athletic directors and the directors of parks and recreation and that was one of the barriers that they identified to the task force as being quite difficult. And what was happening was that students were being pulled out of class in order to attend sporting events. So I was just thinking in the case of if they're get, not getting out till five, I mean they have a later dismissal already at the school you mentioned, that's what made me think of it. The students in special magnet programs, they have the regular school day and then they attend two extra classes after the school day. So it's a certain group of the children, of the students at the schools that have that extended day, but that happens in several of our high schools. And I know the early report too had mentioned, and I'm not as familiar with their schedule, that it would impact um, Cat North and Cat South. Yeah, as we move the high school schedule, so too does Cat North and Cat South have to move their schedules. Now, currently, Cat North and Cat South also offer an exploratory program for our middle schools. And, you know, as our general, our, our uh, colleague from Fairfax County said, that's just something we would have to adjust accordingly if we made the move. Allison. I pressed my button so long ago, I'm not even sure what question I wanted to ask anymore. But you all have done a phenomenal job. Our, our staff and you guys are, 
I've already made some shifts. Um, one thing that we haven't, the conversation hasn't quite moved towards is the budget. And we have some excellent options presented that are new to even what was in the stakeholder survey, but we have to be very clear that an $8.9 million price tag is going to come with other ripple effects that I don't know if the community fully grasps. I mean, that means if we're going to go ask the county council for another $8.9 million over maintenance of effort, something is going to have to give in our current priorities of the school district. So who wants to pick? I mean, is it going to be triple E? Or um, we're probably going to hear from TAC on this issue. So um, I think that's just something that has to be stated publicly. And I'm doing a lot of that tonight, stating things publicly. <laughs> because we're not, we have, a, we have a long way to go in getting the community behind investing this amount of money. I mean, we, can, we, can, we can control when they have to be at school, but we, no amount of legislation can tell us when they're going to go to bed. So I just, we just need to be clear about that. And we, I think we have a long way to go. And I'd love to hear, I think you said you started this in April 2012 in Fairfax in the conversations. And you've just implemented your change this school year. So that, I think that's, you didn't make these decisions in haste. You also have a budget shortfall. Yeah. Um, so oh, we don't. We don't. You do. No. We, <laughs> so. so the reality is, the reality is, yes, we did work through this procedurally, much like you've been doing. It is, it is an evolution, and it is a process, and that that does take the appropriate requisite time. We did have pressures to do it overnight. We had pressures to get it done for the next school year before we went out and had a lot of that communication and feedback in the process. And we felt it appropriate to give it the requisite amount of time before implementation to make sure that any adjustments that we may not have even accommodated for, and the ones that Todd mentioned that we experienced as a part of the implementation of this change, we could help people through in our community. So it was, it was procedurally uh, specific to go ahead and implement it over time and to give the appropriate time to make sure that we over-communicated. The video you saw with the message board, that was uh, part of our communication process once we had gotten the approval was, okay, n now it has to be implemented, right? Now we have to operationalize this great plan that we've been working about with our communities. And the law enforcement folks, the police department, um, they, they really stepped up, the Virginia Department of Transportation. We had a number of folks that we engaged in as a part of that uh, communication. Um, but it did, it did take the appropriate time to do that. Yes. Yeah, that that's just a, a, a concern, that we do this and we do it well and we do it with full community support and full funding. I don't want to do anything hastily. And I don't know what your budget deadlines are here. Um, but just looking at different districts and how they've done it, um, Arlington County had a very smooth transition. I think their school board voted on which change they were going to use. It was either in December or January of the year prior to implementation. So if I had a follow-up question to Allison's, when, when Fairfax decided that they were going to start the middle schools first and then high schools you, you selected a plan how long from that selection point to your implementation the vote was october 23rd of last year so one year ago but you know so less than a year between the vote and the so they voted and then you began the communication or yeah, we had had the communication going on throughout the process, right. but we started that phase of the component of the communication. Um, we, had, we had teacher groups that were talking to us about different, uh, we have school age child care, which is a county program run as well, much like you were talking about with your parks. Um, but the same type of thing, we had folks bringing up ideas and different concerns that they had and trying to help them navigate through their personal issues and concerns that they might have uh, brought up. And, um, you know, we, we, in our reach out, much of the things you've done, in our reaching out with the daycare providers, they were excited at the opportunity for expansion of business. 
So instead of it being an impediment, they did want notification, but they, they did say, you know, this, we'd be able to assist and accommodate you in this regard. So it really was, um, that process helped us in developing more of the next phase of the communication of the implementation. Did any of you all consider doing a phased in approach where you decided ultimately you want to have your window here, but you're going to start, you know, say your ultimate window is 830 to 4 for all schools, but you started with this? We did, we did talk about a phased in approach. Um, in fact, when there was a, I call it a rush to getting a program implemented, um, the, the deal with that is the same as, uh, in my opinion, the same as doing a pilot in any one area. Because of the complexities associated, and you've heard from the transportation experts about the uh, complexities of the, and the interrelationships of all the different routes and the runs and the uh, transportation tiers, um, which impacts the actual bell schedule start times of, say, the elementary schools, because that's the majority of the number of facilities, um, and then rippling effect associated with it that was talked about. Each of those components are so inextricably linked that if you went ahead and took just one group out, well, then you were providing a specialized service within your overarching whole campaign. So it, it really would have been um, uh, problematic and uh, really cumbersome for us to try and execute or operationalize that. Uh, one of the examples that was really a proven concept for us is our, our, the Magnet School, Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. It has, in essence, a, a run, if you will, embedded through their starting and, and ending times of the day that really just services is that school for the most part. So it's a specialized transportation for them, and that is pretty, uh, pretty costly. Yeah, it's countywide. So if, if we went ahead and did it for one pilot, it would have had that kind of same similar impact to be specialized. But you didn't think about doing a change this year and then doing further changes next year? As far as phasing what we've already done? Well, we, we did look at that at the beginning. Um, but really, to go ahead and execute something like that was really, there was, there was enough confusion around change to begin with that to try and articulate that, and as was articulated earlier, and then you mentioned the high school leagues and the athletic directors at our high schools, and the communities that they have influence over, or vice versa, sometimes I wonder. Um, it would have been challenging at best a sporting opportunity to try and get that all in sync um, because there was concern from the athletics about different end times of day and how much practice time one team would get versus another. That was ancillary, but it was there. So I'll just, just to clarify, when I said starting high schools at different times, it, I, it could be 10 minutes, it could be 20, you know, there's, I wasn't saying like hours apart. So the only discussion we had about phasing in was the, the model where you just shift the entire day. There was some talk, although it didn't get much traction, of doing a portion of that and then another portion in later years. But if you tried to do anything where you, where you flip schools or change the order of schools or whatever, I, I can't imagine trying to phase that in. There's just the, the logistical challenges that are seem overwhelming to me. Did any of you, I know we have so much research on middle and high school and, and teen sleep. What about research on the ideal time to have elementary school students in school? Have you come across research that talks about the best learning times for elementary students are between X and Y? So when we did our task force research, and tell me, you guys probably found similar. Tell me if you found something else. Um, what we found in general was that the younger kids are typically awake earlier and ready to go earlier. And so there, there's sort of a general feeling that somewhat earlier, without putting them into hazardous dark conditions, was better. Now, Fairfax has elementary schools, you know, starting historically between 750 and 925. So we have a whole range and um, we could probably do a good experiment. The sweet spot's 830. <laughs> but, um, that was what we saw now sleep wise what i've read also it, it, it's consistent with you know younger children are able to adapt to an earlier bedtime and an earlier awake time 
typically on average. And then I guess my last question is really um, logistics as well. If we were going to do a flip, why is a flip costly if you're going to still run the same bus routes but at different times? So if you if we run elementary last now and we run high school first, what if we had all the elementary run go first and the high school run go last? Why is that going to cost extra money? So there's there's not a simple answer to that question, but let me let me talk a little bit about that. We found that when we did computer modeling on some of those flips, in the morning when we're when we're really competing with rush hour traffic, when we took our longer high school runs, so so you essentially can average the length of your bus routes by thinking about how many schools you have, right? So we have um, the fewest number of schools at our high school level, so they have traditionally the longest runs. When we took those from being first in the morning and made them anything other than first in the morning, we found that that um, did two things. If we didn't expand our window of operation in the morning, we had to add buses. If we did expand the window of operation in the morning enough to accommodate those longer runs being anything other than first, um, either the number of bus routes went up and raised the price, or um, or we that increasing that window of operation required that pay differential that I talked about that raised the price up. And it also, when you increase the window of, of, of start times in the morning from your first start time to your last start time, it, it, um, it leads to the issue that Ms. Birds was talking about earlier. On the end of the day, then, you have to expand the window on the other end of the day also, and you have the unintended consequence of, of students coming home later than you would like. So Fairfax is a little different because our length of the day between the elementary and the high school and the middle school is the same. So I think part of the reason Montgomery has this issue is because your elementary school day is shorter. So that makes a difference in your morning. Correct. Your right now, there is a differential of, it used to be a half hour difference between the length of secondary and an elementary. Now uh, we've in this process, we lengthened our elementary day by 10 minutes, so the differential is only 20. But we we enjoy the benefit of that difference during our morning routes. So essentially, there, um, compared to the afternoon, there is a an extra 20 minutes between our middle school start time and our first elementary start time, which really helps us deal with morning rush hour. If you do the the flip piece, to make it work reasonably, you have to you have to start all of the the four starting times of our school in fairly rapid succession in the morning, and then you get that that gap in the afternoon when you don't need it as much, and so that mm -hmm. that uh, that actually and leads to higher costs for us also. Right, and the, the, that's the beauty of having the software with the expertise, because I can tell you that when I talked about Tom Italiano, he and Sherry Woodsman went through many different iterations, um, really dissecting and analyzing these types of details, because truly the devil is in the details in in all of this it may sound very complicated and complex and it is but it is something that is uh, able to be gone through and articulated so by looking at these nuances these elements these components you heard about a difference in the start of the day well that was one piece but there are also different elements you talked about the Naval Academy and some of the elements like that we have Fort Belvoir we have the CIA we have a number of different places as well each of those individual components need to be looked at and broken down by a talented staff coupled with some automation so you can facilitate a little bit of an ease of your anal analytical data on those to see, wait a minute, what, what passes your smell test, you know? What is it? Something's, something's just not quite right here so that you can actually break it on down. Um, those are good examples that you both mentioned. And that's, the software does come in handy for that kind of thing when you're trying to look at a lot of different options and a a lot of different ways of rearranging the schools and the buses the software can help make it you know a little bit faster and Jeff will tell you you know I was a pain because I was at home working with my own software with the school systems data in it double checking everything they did which is important and asking questions and saying you know what what about this option here's one we haven't looked at and he was like okay but this is absolutely the last one Dr. Frank. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for coming here, and I'm glad to see all the parents out in the audience as well. 
Um, we've talked about an, uh, a big range of things here, and I'd kind of like to bring it back to the science. Um, my uh, son now, who is in his 40s, had an impossible time getting up at 7, 17 in the morning, but he ultimately did graduate from high school and went on from there. So I'd like to bring this back to the science, if I could. Um, um, can we talk about the science of what is an appropriate time for adolescents to get up in the morning? And uh, we, we've talked about the cost of things. We've talked about uh, the bus schedule. And, and, and to use a, a euphemism here, I really like to know who's driving the bus here. I'd like to think it's the science, and I'd like to think that we're going to talk about what is the appropriate time for adolescents to get to school in the morning and in the margins we'll figure out where to come up with the buses and the money. Thank you very much for the applause. So I'd like some comments on, on that if I could. So I'm sure our colleagues from both counties could also answer this but what I'll say is Mr. Frank, uh, Dr. Frank, you were, um, you're spot on in the sense that we talked about that long and hard in the task force. And the notion is is that what, what the Academy of Pediatrics and the American Medical Association and the CDC are all saying is about an eight to nine hour sleep, eight and a half, nine and a half hours of sleep for the adolescent. So depending on when they go to bed, which the science does show that they don't naturally go to bed at nine o'clock at night. So they naturally go to bed, they're their circadian rhythms go such that they will go to bed later than younger children. So if they go to bed at 11 o'clock at night, then eight to nine hours later is when they would get up. And so then we are talking about a start time at the you know eight o'clock, 8.30 range as being ideal um, from the science point of view. That doesn't take into account any of the Practicalities that sometimes offer us the challenges. But every challenge is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll make a rational decision here, and I appreciate all your comments, and I hope we'll hear from more of you as time goes on. Thank you. Mrs. Picker. Yeah, every, every challenge definitely is an opportunity, and we have um, heard from our um, start school later folks a lot. I would just hope that we were also planning to communicate with the rest of the county as they um, think about how they want their tax dollars spent and what time they want their children to go to school. We have lots of opportunities facing uh, the school board and we're going to have to make some, make some decisions that we think serve the entire county. Um, but this was a great start to this conversation. And while I do think a lot of work has been done, we haven't made any decisions. So we have a lot of work ahead of us before this can actually happen, in my opinion. But thank you for coming. This is Richie things occurred when they were talking about the magnet programs especially if you if you switch so that the high schools are starting later there's nothing that stops them from not having the extended day at the beginning of the day as opposed to the end of the day is there so we did talk about that in the start time so uh, across the nation some of the school systems that have shifted to later days for all the various science reasons have also entertained many different options for the beginning of the day. So some people do a zero period for conditioning for their athletes. They do a zero period for AP classes that they can't offer during the day. So what the Start Times Task Force in Anne Arundel actually came to the agreement with was if we're going to start school later for the good of students, we should start school later. And so we didn't put anything in that zero period time frame. But your point's well taken, Mrs. Ritchie. You know, could you? Yes we didn't bring an option forward for your, your consideration just because we went with the belief that starting school later for adolescents' sake was what we would bring forward. Oh, and I absolutely believe mm -hmm. that. I mean, that's, but that has been some of the stuff that's been yes. talked about before. Is and that, across well, the nation. Okay if those students want to take those programs and they can come into earlier. I mean, uh -huh. I've heard that from the community who have said, well, 
for some kids, it's okay for them to come in. If they want to do athletics and it's going to interfere and it's going to be at the end, they can come in early and start the practice or, or so forth like that. So, so that's the issue. The other thing that um, we haven't been able to get from Fairfax, and I think that some of the reason why you probably had a really good start time was people were all panicking and probably either leaving early or coming later. So <laughs> next year, I'd like to hear what your, your, your first day of school was like with the buses, only because then people aren't, you know, um, and it's the first day of school is always a mess with buses because people forget that school started and hmm. until they see them riding down the street and they go, oh, yeah, school started. And so, um, so, so you know, so that's that's a piece of it. I think that for us, we, we've done a lot of the work. We have the science. We understand the science. We, we've accepted the science. The piece that we have to work with now is the community piece. I think that's going to be our biggest challenge in terms of ensuring that all voices from all parts of the county are heard because there are still people out there who say just put your kids to bed earlier whether you like it or whether you don't that's the issue the issue is that you have to face and you have to talk to people about because that's what you have to do and i'm never going to convince them that they can't that it's circadian rhythms and stuff they're not going to hear that piece so we have to be able to under make sure our people understand the second piece is our county council has taken a resolution they all voted unanimously everybody's very happy about that the bucks have to follow that without impacting some of the other programs because one of our our biggest goal our 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 only goal in our school system is to close the achievement opportunity gap for all students not just some students not for just a pocket of students for every student and we know that there are certain things again that science has proven in in terms of research that research has proven that when you do these certain programs i.e. early education, making sure kids are able to, to access um, education at an early start, making sure that kids are able to read and, and on target. Those things also cost money. And I've been very public about it and will continue to be very public about it, that if the money doesn't follow, I'm not voting for it no matter what, because I know that we have to make sure that we reach kids at the very beginning. And I'm not saying the kids at the end you know or we just let them slide off that's not at all it but i also know that we've invested a lot of money at the at the other end and now we need to start front loading this and so we have to remember to ask for if it's going to cost us six million dollars that's an addition to not in place of and and i to use allison's where i want to be real clear and real public about it and i've and i've been real clear and public about it because that's an issue but i think that our next step, if you will, is that we need to start really developing a communication and an avenue to, to looking at really our viable options. Which ones do we going to take out? We can take you know the whole plethora out, but if you don't bring to us on the board something that's that has a support, not an overwhelming support, because I don't believe there's you're ever going to get anything that's going to have an overwhelming support, but one third, one third, one third. I'm not sure that, you know, we're going to make a decision that's going to, and I'm not about making people happy. That's not about the issue, but the issue is about you have to take into consideration what our public feels uh, in terms of parents and, and their, their very real, very honest concerns. So thank you all very much. Mrs. Hummer. Um, I know on the survey there weren't a significant number of teachers that responded to this survey. Have we heard a lot? from the teachers about how the start times will affect them, um, what their feelings are. It seems the most prefer no change. So this is, you can see that that is what we saw from the 629 employees who responded. Most of them were teachers of the 629. We heard some of those, you know, we heard from some bus drivers. We heard from, I mean, we heard from. So you heard from others. All facets of the organization, but the majority of those employees' responses are from teachers. However, it's, you know, it's not a huge percentage. It's not a huge, and I'd be curious, I, I, I wish, I hope teachers that are listening that we could hear more from them, because I'd like to find out elementary school, because, you know, many elementary school students have young children. How is it impacting them job-wise if we move these things, that, that we can really weigh those things out when it comes to and the later day, you know, for I know many of our elementary school teachers now have a hard time getting to daycare in time, you know, before the end time. So if we move it back, how those would be affected. Um, I don't know if y'all looked at this, but I'm wondering. So we have our concerns about elementary school starting later um, and, and going longer. If we 
went for that to to begin with, but we had a plan for down the road of what the cost would be to add more buses specifically for elementary schools so that we could move some of those elementary schools earlier. If that is a cost option that we could look at, you so know, you, you can see that here. Road. Ms. Lane, you want to speak to that? Sure. If you if you look um, in the um, center where it says E1, where we shifted schools to dismiss by 415, to do that for two schools with 20 buses added $1.2 million. So if you jump to the column, yellow column, uh, row above that, now you're talking 58 buses at $60,000 a piece and 79 buses at $60,000 a piece. So every one of those yellow rows would be calculated in that fashion. And that's averaging $60,000 a bus if you have to add a whole bus and overlapping over what we're doing right So now. that's a significant cost if just if we were trying to target elementary schools to do less. Okay. Right. So you can see in the bottom E2 option to run 87 buses that moved four schools earlier was $5.2 million. Okay. Thank just you. Just by way of example. Mrs. Malley. <laughs> when you said that, it brought to mind what Mrs. Payne said. All right, we're saying it's this much, but we need to dig deeper. Am I correct, Mrs. Payne? You are correct. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, I'm not saying those numbers aren't accurate, but I'm saying we need to look exactly. for. Exactly. It's, I'm not saying they're not accurate either. They're, they probably are accurate, but it might not be the best case scenario. Exactly. That's what I'm, so if we went that way, we would need to really. My, um, I've been thinking about this since the earlier talk and Mrs. Talar came up. I, I, I've been to many, many evening high school graduations. I know the impact, the one good impact that uh, our evening schools have on students, especially students who have had various struggles. And I'm concerned if we do, I'm concerned, I keep running around when you said it was going to be reduced, you could only offer three courses rather than five. Have you looked at, is there any, I mean, we talked about earlier, is there any other ways we could get students to take have the opportunity I worry about the students not able to take but three courses this would have a huge impact we may not we're talking about some of our most challenged students not I mean challenged by life sometimes challenged by uh, opportunity is there any option if we had for that, I mean, just cut and dry. They start now at three. If they start at four thirty, they can't take but three classes. Is that? Well, I think as Fairfax has reiterated, every uh, challenge is an opportunity. And as I mentioned earlier, we are exploring the um, online option of blended learning. That's proven very effective for our students in in this earliest runs, our second semester at it. Um, also with partnerships with the community college and opportunities to partner therein. Mm -hmm. um, Put us a chat. Put a challenge in front of us, Mrs. Nally, and and we can figure it out. Good. So I just, and I would just add that Thank later you. start times improves graduation rates. That's one of the benefits. So maybe they, maybe they wouldn't need the evening. Well, it isn't. For me. these students. Well, many. Uh, yeah. Over the years, no, I it's, I understand. It's, it's different it's, circumstances. They, right. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Pickard. <laughs> this is this this tonight is the first time I've ever spoke from my seat. Um, on the just to, to, to <laughs> the floodgates have opened. Um, just to piggyback on what Mrs. Hummer had stated about teachers, as I have visited schools and some of the elementary schools that have currently a late start time, I w uh, a principal indicated to me quite clearly that she would have 10 teachers who would leave if that school started any minute later. And that is a huge concern and it's, it's a stakeholder group we have to, we have to tap into as we make these decisions. We cannot just pass them by. Absolutely. If I can just add to that, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Madam Chair, uh, President, the, the deal on that is it's very emotional 
and very individualized concerns that are being raised with that. We heard a lot of that resistance as well. You know, it's kind of amazing to me that, that when we talked about um, testing assessment of students, um, it's one thing, but when we go back to our uh, teaching professions, which are amazing individuals that do incredible things each day, the teaching and learning that goes on in the classrooms, and we start talking about testing them, we get all this instant uh, kind of pushback in a sense. This change was not without that same type of, I'm going to lose 20 of my best teachers. You know, we didn't see that to come to fruition. And the way I look at that is, for me, I felt professionally as I failed in the attempts to assuage all of the individual concerns in my communication outreach. We, uh, we reached out to our, our teachers and our professional staff. We met with the individual representative groups of those and heard about some of the concerns, some about the shared programs. And, um, and we took the feedback that we got very seriously to try and address a lot of those issues. And some of it was just a part of that change. And as I said about it being individualized, there was daycare, there was, you pick it, you name it. Well, I appreciate, I really do appreciate what you're saying, but this, this would be, these were not just fear of change sort of things. This would impact their students or their children go to school at 8 o'clock sure. or, you know, they have. Their personal situation. Their, their personal, it's Absolutely. not, it's not just, I don't want to start my school day at right. 9.55. Mm -hmm. It's like, I won't be able to pick up my child after school. Right. And even though I love the current school I'm teaching in, I would like to voluntarily transfer to another school. Mm -hmm that doesn't start it. I don't think y'all elementary schools would start that late as one of these options. No, not 955. I mean, that's, no. that's insane. We've already kept everybody about 30 minutes past the time we said we would end. But I just want to thank everyone who came out tonight, especially those of you that have to come back tomorrow night. Um, we've learned a lot. We've asked a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> I'm not that group not right now. No, you're not in that group. You guys are okay. But we really very much appreciate your time and, and all of your expertise, so thank you.